Heston discovers a world turned upside down, where humans run wild in the jungles and the superior beings are apes. Planet of the Apes, a fascinating civilization where apes build the cities and control the laws. Charlton Heston, Roddy McDowell, Kim Hunter, and Morris Evans star in Planet of the Apes, beyond your wildest dreams. Star Trek action figures also sold separately. Comics. My spidey sense is tingling. Collectibles. Sold $325. Books. I'm a best-selling author. RPGs. Where are the Cheetos? Video games. Grab and peels. <laughs> Music. <laughs> Anime. I'm the hero. This is the G to V Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the G to V Podcast. This is your co-host, Arnold T. Blumberg from Baltimore, Maryland, and I am joined as ever by... Scott Woodard from Portland, Oregon. And today we also are joined by a very special guest. Today we're going to devote an episode of the podcast to certainly one of my all-time favorite uh, sci-fi franchises ever, which is about to have another installment coming out later this year, in the summer, actually, in July of 2014. But first we want to welcome a special guest, uh, which is Scott Kalora, who is joining us. Uh, he is editor of IGN and also a co-host of the Transporter Room 3 podcast, which covers all manner of things Star Trek. And thanks very much for joining us today, Scott. Hey, thanks for having me on board. I appreciate it. And how did you know that Transporter Room 3 was related to Star Trek? What was the, the giveaway there, I wonder? It was, it was tough, but there were some clues. <laughs> there were some clues. <laughs> a little thinking. Um, I, I thought this was lost. That was a Lost in Space show. Now I'm all confused. <laughs> yeah. danger, and yet, danger. If, if you think about it, it all works out. No, but there, and also, one of the main reasons that we were having you on, as I was uh, starting to say, is one of the my favorite franchises of all time. I know it's one that you also share as well, besides the fact that we agree on so many things related to Star Trek. One of the things we both have also talked about from time to time over the years is how much we love stuff related to Planet of the Apes. Oh, yeah. Today we're going to talk about the apes a little bit, and as I was mentioning, uh, the apes are back in the theater. <laughs> uh, okay, Danny. <laughs> later this year. Well, f- first of all, I should mention that we've actually passed a significant anniversary because we passed technically last year the 50th anniversary of Planet of the Apes in the sense that Pierre Boulle's original novel upon which the entire franchise in the first film was based was first published in 1963. So huh. everybody was celebrating Doctor Who's 50th anniversary. It was also technically the 50th anniversary for Planet of the Apes, or at least for Monkey Planet, for the book. Uh, Interesting. And Pla- huh. Yeah, and Planet of the Apes came out in 68, so we've got that anniversary to look forward to uh, a little ways down the line. But it's been, uh, it's been through quite a rebirth, thanks mainly to uh, the release of Rise of the Planet of the Apes a few years ago which not only revitalized interest in the entire series and the franchise, but basically started it again, sort of, kind of, and is now having its first sequel coming up this summer, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, uh, with uh, that uh, ever-reliable motion capture actor Andy Serkis starring once again as Caesar. But no, uh, James Fr- no James Franco this time, right? No James Franco this time. See, I count that as a plus, but some people <laughs> I think, necessarily... Franco, I think Franco counts it as a plus, too. I get that feeling that he kind of sort of won and done on it, yeah. Oh, hmm. yeah, maybe. Not that he wasn't good in Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Well, he was supposed to die. Time. He was supposed to die originally. In the, they actually shot – the original ending was he, he gets killed, mm-hmm. um, and then they went back, right? Only a few weeks before it came out, I, supposedly, um, and resurrected him only to kill him in the sequel, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if we'll get any reference to it, but presumably in the years between the two, as the virus has been ravaging the planet, we'll just find out, oh yeah, he killed over at some point. Yeah, I think probably, <laughs> yeah. But they didn't want to, they didn't want to end on a downer. Like, like the fact that we're heading toward a future which you had to find out. <laughs> That's studio thinking for you, right? <laughs> and by the, the way, kid, I mean, I was, I like it if he dies on camera. I was already weeping when the gorilla got killed, so... Yes! Ah, uh, yeah, man. 
Yeah, it's a moving thing. Well, that and I guess that's one thing maybe we could start out with because there's so much to talk about. There's the the book started it all, but I'm sure there are many people that are fans that even if they went back to discover the book later, it's the movies. It's particularly our memories growing up watching the five original films uh, with Roddy McDowell and Kim Hunter and Mars Evans and everybody involved in that. And then there's the TV series, short lived. Yay! I watched that. <laughs> Darcy and Hutch on the Planet of the Apes. <laughs> right? One of many fugitive theme shows. It's just, you know, your heroes move from town to town, pursued. Uh, there's the almost forgotten, but seems to be getting a bit of a resurgence in awareness now, uh, Return of the Planet of the Apes cartoon series. Oh, yeah. Which is very odd in that it, it uh, borrows a little bit more from Bull's novel and puts them in more of a 20th century style uh, ape world. Right. Uh, yeah. There are the comics, and there are tons of those, whether you're dealing with Marvel or countless other companies that have done uh, Planet of the Apes comics over the years. And then, of course, you get up to, well, you know, if if we don't say anything about the Tim Burton remake for the rest of the episode. That- <laughs> <laughs> uh, apart from the makeup, though, which was excellent. Yeah. And what – and. Well, we won't say much more about it, but what the hell? Because, I mean, Tim Burton, who can, who can make such good movies, how does that happen? I don't understand. I was just I, watching Ed Wood the other night, which I love. Mm-hmm. And, and I think he, you know, I think something like Ed Wood comes from this place of real affection for Burton as a, as a real fan himself of genre stuff. And, um, and I, so I think he, you know, he's clearly was an Apes fan, but yet you wind up with that movie. It's just puzzling to me. Yeah, it's really strange. And, and I'm not kidding. I, I think that the makeup's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, some, some of the design stuff is very interesting. Although, again, I felt like I was rebelling a little bit because it was just so different. Like, it wasn't a reinvention of anything we'd seen from the way the apes had their environment in the original films. And it just seemed, where where was all this coming from? And that and right. this desperate need to come up with a new twist ending. Right. Yeah. Um, that just felt like it fell really flat. Yeah, but, just, it yeah. didn't make any sense. Yeah, and no sense at all. No, it's just a misfire. And like the and it's like the only good thing in it is that you get Charlton Heston as an ape. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and I no, guess, like you. Oh, go ahead. I guess for Burton, he met his he met his current wife or partner, uh, Helena Bonham Carter, on that one. So I guess that was, was a that plus. where they met. I okay. uh, that's where they. I think that's where it. I just, I just, this is kind of embarrassing to admit, but after I watched Ed Wood, I was just like Googling, um, Lisa Marie, you know, Burton's former, uh, <laughs> former paramour. And uh-huh. I was, I was wondering what happened there, but they weren't, they're not together anymore. And from what I could gather, it seemed as though it was Planet of the Apes, which Lisa Marie is in as well. Um, mm-hmm. that at some point during the making of that film, Burton went from a Lisa Marie kind of guy to a Helena Bonham Carter kind of guy. So, well, as long as she kind of looked like Michael Jackson. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I was going to say it's creepy to think that the whole relationship began while she was under the ape makeup. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I want some of that. <laughs> uh, Anyway, <laughs> so we definitely spent way too much time on the Burton Apes. We? Yeah, that's we, right. well, that's done. All right. Move it aside. That's it. We're done with that. And if any of you out there like that one, well, then this isn't the episode for you then. <laughs> you can show. And we're also not going to talk about what we were just talking about before we started recording, right, Arnold? No. no. Re- revenge. Revenge from Planet Ape. Yeah, we also will be covering that. <laughs> <laughs> Although you should probably hear a bit of that at some point, but we'll see. I'll I'll, I'll play uh, part of the um, I'll play part of that trailer in the episode. <laughs> Legend has it, almost three thousand years ago, a simian civilization of super intelligent apes struggled with man to gain control of this planet. In the end, man conquered ape after a brutal battle, which saw him destroy the ape, his culture, and society. After this battle, man tortured and killed all the ape prisoners by piercing their eyes with a red-hot poker. One of the prisoners, who was also the leader of the apes, vowed they would return from the dead to avenge man's brutality at a point in time before man destroyed Earth himself. That time is now. But one of the things I was actually going to throw out uh, from the beginning was uh, going back to the original five films and uh, a series that 
long before Star Wars and long before so many other trilogies, whether it's Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings. I mean, this was five. This wasn't three. But a series that certainly meant as much to kids growing up then as it did to so many of us that came along after that. And I was seeing it on television, of course, and 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 it was like an era in the 70s, and I'm sure you remember too, where it seemed like – for me in Baltimore, I remember it was local channel 45 that it seemed every other month would run a Planet of the Apes week <laughs> and run all the movies five days from Monday to Friday. It was like a guaranteed ratings winner <laughs> to run all those movies, and you oh, just yeah. never stopped seeing them. Yeah, I don't know. Is that the same where you were? Or was Were you seeing them turning up on television all the time? Uh, well, I, we definitely had Planet of the Apes week here in New York, um, and it was um, – uh, I don't know if it was quite as often. I don't know if it was every few months or more like a, an annual occurrence. But it would be like the afternoon movie um, on local channel 7, ABC. But you'd only get, as I remember it, you'd only get the first four movies because they would split the first film into two parts. So really? You get, yeah, so you would get the uh, the, char- the first Heston film, part one on Monday, and then part two on Tuesday. Uh, no, I don't so, remember that ever. Okay. Yeah, and so then beneath um, um, Escape, a Conquest, and ba- Battle for the Planet of the Apes, I, I, had, I never saw that one as a kid, or at least it, it took a really long time for me to finally see it um, because it would always get bumped by the time Friday came. The- <laughs> it, oh, how funny. Yeah, so. That's really weird. I, didn't, I, I don't remember that ever happening. I guess they were showing a severely edited version of the first movie when they were running it. I mean, that's... I mean, that's the way I remember it. I mean, what's the running time on the first film? It's not like it's, you know, it's not a gone with the wind length <laughs> picture. If so I, I remember know. though, it's almost like exactly 2 hours or around there. So for them to for them to cut them up like that, I don't know what. I mean, it's it doesn't seem to make sense looking back we on We talked it now. on a previous episode when we talked about the ABC Sunday Night Movie quite a few episodes back, we were already talking about some of the weird things we remember from childhood about weird editing. Yeah. going on whenever a TV station would get a hold of a movie. So it'd be no surprise, really, that some weird choice was made along the way. Well, and that I, also, got... I also remember these weird promos, and you might be able to f- educate me on this, but there were these weird promos with uh, Roddy McDowell in character as his, yes. his Apes TV show character, though, right? Do you remember those? Yes. You can now find them online. Uh, if I can track these down, they'll be in our show notes also, because... It was only a few years ago that I even found out these existed, that at some point, and I can't remember how late along that was, they got Roddy McDowell to come in. I think it was – was it in the 80s where they made those? And they put him in makeup as Galen again, hosting the reruns of the original films. Right. And it's him sitting in like some kind of like library setting. Yeah. Uh, discussing the fact that these are, this is like the history of his planet, and they're really creepy because yeah. – <laughs> Watch all of them. By the end of them, there's this little thing about him playing with like a little marionette or a doll or something, like a human doll. Like we know where this is all going, don't we? And it's really kind of, it's more <laughs> disturbing than the movies often are. <laughs> but that's saying great. something. <laughs> and there you have it. And there you have it. Verdon and Burke. Oh well, they found their computer in another city and disappeared into space as suddenly as they arrived. What about me? Mm, I certainly could have gone with them. Back to your time, your world, uh, where apes are kept in zoos. Uh, uh, tell me now, would you have come to my world willingly? Hmm? You will eventually. Of course. Hmm. It's only a matter of time. Do you like movies? Well, let me make you an offer that you can't refuse. Have you ever found yourself standing at the local Cineplex with that smell of freshly buttered popcorn wafting through your nostrils, wondering if that new Hugh Jackman movie is really worth your time? Or have you ever lamented about that time you spent scouring the vast expanse of the internet for movie and DVD release dates when, let's be honest, you'd rather be leveling up your troll hunter, working on the great American novel, or even watching kitten videos? Oh yes, I said kitten videos. I will do the work for you. All I ask is 15 to 30 minutes of your time every Tuesday. My name is Michael Faulkner, and every Tuesday is showtime at the Weekly Plex, your audio guide to what's new at the box office, how the top 10 fared over the weekend, and what's coming to your home theater on DVD and Blu-ray. 
You can find the weekly Patio Plex on the Chronic Rift Network at www.chronicrift.com, along with a plethora of other podcasts that explore the culture in pop culture. The weekly Patio Plex, brought to you by the Chronic Rift. Thanks for listening. We'll see you at the theater. That's a wrap. The only good human is a dead human. The bizarre world you met on the planet of the apes was just the beginning. What lies beneath may be the end. 20th Century Fox takes you beneath the planet of the apes. This is the year 3955 AD. The apes are building a war machine aimed at planet domination. Superhuman mutants strike back with new and terrifying weapons of the mind. In the atomic rubble of what was once the city of New York, civilization's final battle is about to begin. The only good human is a dead human! Beneath the planet of the apes, with James Franciscus, Kim Hunter, Maurice Evans, Linda Harrison, and Charlton Heston. Can a world long endure half ape, half man? The answer lies deep beneath the planet of the apes. In color, rated G, general audiences. Now, you see, locally, we also had, I'm assuming they were made for the channel, I, I, and I have them on videotape somewhere, because I, I did those on VHS when they were running, of them promoting the Ape Week on 45 with these promos that would be like a guy, like an executive at the at the office at the, the channel saying, yeah, the Apes movies, yeah, we'll run them all week, yeah, that's right. And then it's like, and would end with some stupid joke like, they'll go ape. And he spins around his chair and he's wearing perfect looking John Chambers apes makeup. And wow. He's like a, an orangutan. Yeah. <laughs> and Pretty good that, for local TV, right? Yeah. And it was just like, wow, this is just, they're just so buying into it and celebrating it all. It was just so much fun. <laughs> That's great. So, yeah, I don't know if maybe they padded out the, but like, again, you know, I have this memory of them being, of the first film being cut in two. I'm wondering if they padded it out with those Galen promos and just ran but, them all in the first two days. I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. That's really strange. But well, And unfortunately, I have no memory at all, <laughs> which is typical anyway, of where I originally saw them. And I don't remember Ape Weeks in my, uh, um, in my local market. I was in upstate New York, so... No ideas. That's really weird too, because yeah. it, it's such it's such a part of the fan the apes fandom too, in the sense that anybody that's really like steeped in it also remembers the posters when they did the re release of the five movies. Oh yeah. And like twentieth yeah. Century Fox wants you to go ape and, and even recently, you know, as retro revivals have taken hold more and more, um like in Portland, for instance, where you can't go anywhere. I'm surprised you don't have Apes Week there every week right now. Um, you, you see those the, the five are run over and over and over again. Like that was a thing. That was a thing. Like you're not just watching the first movie. We're going to do the whole series, whether it was television or in theaters. Right. It was always like a package deal, experiencing that whole series from beginning to end. Yeah, and I remember my because when did they re- when did they first re-release the five? As a package, it was a, it was a. Oh, I I should have done the research on that before we started. I'll have yeah. to look. I don't remember for sure what the year was when they first did that. I think uh, it was pretty soon after Battle for the Planet of the Apes, like maybe like a year or two. Um, well, and also you got to think that was right at that point is when everything is exploding in the sense that they've gotten to the end of the movie series, but they're heading into the TV show. Right. Mm-hmm. They do the TV show that year. They're, it's massive promotion. Toys are coming out. You got the Mego stuff that also mm-hmm. came along. And that's another side to this, too. If there's one oh, thing yeah. I would regret, it's that I didn't get, I don't remember if I would even have seen it to get it, like the actual playset, like the village playset, mm-hmm. things like that. I do have a Cornelius somewhere, but that's about the extent <laughs> of it. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's, that's not bad. Um, and, don't get and, me started on Migo because I – how do you pronounce it? Ma- Migo. Migo? Migo? Yeah. Uh, just a quick aside, to, which brings us into Star Trek. I, I had um, the full like collection. I had all the figures or most of them. I had the Enterprise playset yep. and um, my mom had a garage sale and, um, <gasps> oh, and she sold, I know where this is going. Yeah, she sold everything for five, oh my $5. For oh, my everything. God. Oh, it's that's like, it's still like there've been like bad like holidays at my house like where that has come up in conversation and the like Christmas dinner has gone horribly wrong because <laughs> because oh. of those terrible oh. memories. Wow, 
a moment of silence for Scott's lost Mego <laughs> Star Trek collection. No, that that's terrible. That's terrible. years of therapy have have, have <laughs> sort of helped. Sort of helped. <laughs> I, you know, just before we get too far astray, I was going to say in re- reference to those five. Um, you know, when they re released the five as a package, I remember my I must have been pretty small, pretty little kid, and. My cousin, who was older, telling me that they had gone. I think it was a drive-in situation. His fe- him and his brothers and sisters and parents went to see the the five films, and he kind of warped me on it a bit because I don't think I had really seen the Apes films yet um, mm-hmm. or wasn't too familiar. And he he was telling me that the final shot of the first film was a Statue of Liberty with an ape's face, and oh. so it was like I mean he was probably a little kid himself, you know. At the time, he seemed like you know so much older t- than me, but he he was probably eight years old or something, you know. And was so, his name Tim Burton? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So then, when I finally saw the films, it was like I never I never got that scene until the Burton <laughs> one came out, you know. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, I was Lincoln, but <laughs> it's weird though. I because I I I remember vaguely a time, I and mean, my mother was always as much a fan of all the same things. Well, I mean, it's where I got a lot of my interest in things. In fact, the two of us have often joked about the fact that when when she was carrying me, she was watching reruns of Outer Limits. <laughs> so it's like no it's no wonder things were seeping in all all the time. <laughs> but she always liked a lot of the same things. And I just remember I'm assuming it must have been the first time I was seeing it then as a kid, so I don't remember when that was, but seeing it on television at some point in the early seventies and I remember her telling me something about, oh, you're going to have to see that movie but like to be prepared because it has a surprise ending. It has this really the big twist ending that actually really bothered her a lot. She, yeah. she really didn't like the look of it. Didn't like the Statue of Liberty at all. I'm so not, she, didn't I, like I, it as, she didn't like it aesthetically or she was troubled by it? It was like it was creepy. The Statue of Liberty was creepy. Yeah. And 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 I'm not sure if it actually derived from having seen it then or if it just was additional to that the Statue of Liberty always seemed creepy, but it was like it had a particular impact on her because it was that. So I was prepared. I knew something was coming at the end of the first movie, but I didn't know what. Okay. And I don't remember if when you get that that fantastic slow pan and you start to see the edge of the torch and then the edge of her head with the spikes and, and it's like I don't I don't know how today you couldn't put it together pretty quickly, but I I don't know if I did as a kid until you get yeah. the the shot. Yeah. But it's still one of the all time. I mean, if nothing else, I mean, there's so much you could say just about the first movie. I I teach a lot of classes in pop culture and media, and I very often, regardless of the topic of the class, will use Planet of the Apes as a film for when we do a film unit in class, because it's just one of the most meaningful and symbolic and heavily laden with metaphor movies you can possibly choose. Yeah. It has everything. It's got race, it's got gender, it's got class structure. It's got stuff related to the era in which it came out. It has the trial scene where they discuss evolution and I give it to classes today and everything in it sometimes sadly is as relevant right now as it was then when they were talking about it. Sure. And, yeah. And then it has this powerful punch of an ending that's just one of the great surprise endings in film history yeah seriously and and in, in addition to the, all that stuff it's also great uh, you know exciting fun action yeah. type stuff and cool sci-fi and and um you know it has a real scope to it as well i mean the the opening of the um when the um the ship crashes into the sea and everything it's really quite stylish and and um and freaky the sound and the it's like at certain points the the soundtrack is more sound effects than it is music and right uh, right yeah love it no it's be- it's a beautiful looking movie i and i love the beginning i i love that until the until the turning point until the part in the in the field where the gorillas first show up the thing i love most about the beginning of the movie is the beginning of that movie could be any science fiction movie could happen 
you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, the right. fact is, even back then, you were walking into a movie titled Planet of the Apes. <laughs> right. So, it, but what, that's the thing I love about that opening, though. The entire like first part of the movie plays as if they think you, the audience, don't already know where it's going. Right, exactly. And it yeah. feels like there's so much promise there. Not that I, I think it's wonderful, so I'm certainly not disappointed. But there's like so much promise there, like anything could happen. You have no idea where this is going. And then yeah. once it locks down into that one thing, it goes on from there. But that opening is just any science fiction movie that you could think of could happen from this point on. You have no idea. Yeah. And it's it's amazing. And yeah. Charlton yeah. Heston, of course, just commanding everything from the moment he arrives. <laughs> As he does. <laughs> As he does. <laughs> he's such a he's such a jerk, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. George Taylor. I mean the the talk about that op you know, the opening up, you know, when he's He's with his fellow astronauts. I mean, he's giving these guys. He's giving Brent such a hard time, right? Is it Brent the the? Uh, uh Landon, Landon, Landon. Who's yeah. who's? Oh, Brent is from beneath. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, Landon, the fresh faced, younger <laughs> fellow, right? Yeah. He's like, yeah. <laughs> face it. Everything you knew is dead, right? <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> he's not pulling his punches at all. And and yet, you, of course, you still have to get behind the guy as your protagonist because he's, he, well, to to quote him, he's the only game in town, right? Well, see, that's you know? the, that's, that's one of the things that's really fascinating about it. He, and that's part of like the theme of the, he is a complete jerk. He's an yeah. ass to everybody. He's, he's a poor example of humanity. <laughs> and and he knows that himself because he has his monologue. In fact, that's one of the things also. It's like I could always uh, – famously, one of the reasons why it probably has the ending it has is because Rod Serling was involved in mm-hmm. the making of the film. And there's a lot in the movie that feels like an extended Twilight Zone kind of experience. But then they also had Michael Wilson come in and work on the screenplay. And that's where a lot of supposedly the character and some of the emotional, the warmer stuff came in. And it always seems to me, and I, there's no 100% evidence, I don't think, it always seems to me you can tell exactly where Serling kicks in because, particularly in the beginning, every time Heston does one of those long speeches where he's psychoanalyzing somebody, <laughs> that's every character in every Twilight Zone. Yeah, they, nobody exactly. ever talks to each other in Twilight Zone. They tell you, you know what you are? You right, wanna, exactly. They, you know, <laughs> it's just a laundry list of stuff. <laughs> so you know it's Serling doing that. and Absolutely. And so he's... He's like a terrible human being, but then he's our only human being. But it actually goes back to something I was going to bring up right at the very beginning, which is this series shares a lot with another of the greatest cinematic achievements of all time, which, of course, is very different, which is the Godfather series. Because in essence, what happens with both of these series is you wind up being emotionally invested in what would normally be the enemy. Yeah. The turn really happens more or less by the time you get to escape. But yeah. certainly from that point on, our sympathies are with the apes. Yeah, sure. Which, yeah. which doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, but, the people, but we the... love them. We love Cornelius and Zira anyway. Yeah, those who are going to uh, who dominate us someday, or that's who we're rooting for. I mean, you're not rooting for for Eric Braden in Escape for the Planet of the Apes, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, right? No, yeah. see. The problem is now I I kind of halfway do. <laughs> <laughs> we've talked about this actually. This is one of the reasons why this came up probably is because we've we've talked about this from time to time. As a kid growing up, Eric Braden's character in Escape is a monster. Yeah. Because he's horrible. He wants to hurt Cornelius and Zira and their baby, and we hate him. But then when you watch the movie as an adult, you realize Doctor Hasline is a hundred percent right. <laughs> yeah. He's abs- He's a hero. He is he is an absolute hero of the human race who is desperately trying to save the future. But unfortunately, what he doesn't – well, what he partly realized because he even has that speech where he says to the president, I don't even know if what I'm doing is right. Am I helping the future or am I stopping it? And unfortunately, he doesn't know what kind of time travel rules he's dealing with, but he's dealing with the one where the future is happening no matter what he does. Yeah. That doesn't stop him from – and it doesn't stop him from shooting an infant – chimp multiple times either at point blank range. Yes, but that could lead to the entire destruction of humanity's future. Yeah, no, I get I get you. I get you. I mean I I I, I can't a hundred percent blame Dr. Hasline anymore. <laughs> no, 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 no way. I, I hear you, but uh, when you're just a uh I, the average viewer anyway is certainly not rooting for, for him. Oh, right. No. And yeah, the Colossus the Forbin project, if you want to root for him. <laughs> 
<laughs> or his soap operas, you know. Right. When he's, when he's Plague Victor, then, you know. <laughs> G2V. Two longtime fans of two bionic shows discuss an episode in detail every two weeks. Cyborgs, a bionic podcast. Find us at chronicrift.com slash cyborgs or subscribe on iTunes. Name Cornelius, adult chimpanzee, speaks English. Zira, female chimpanzee, practices medicine. Name, Mamie Philo, infant chimpanzee, holds a secret that can destroy mankind. They come from an incredible planet of apes. They survived a war beneath the planet of apes. Now it's Earth 1973, and you're in for a surprise. Are they friendly visitors or invaders from the future? Why does the president's advisor want them shot? Is Baby Milo's incredible secret. All the surprising answers are an escape from the planet of the apes. All new from 20th Century Fox, rated G all ages. Escape from the planet of the apes. But yeah, I mean, and that's that's the thing that always gets me is about it, it's also it's weird. It's a series that begins where your sympathies have to lie first with a guy like you said who's a complete jerk, but who's aware of it, but who also represents our sort of lone symbol of sanity like you know he's trying to find out how could this crazy upside down world have come into existence and of course that's the big reveal but then as you get deeper into the series we're more interested in the apes and yeah. it completely flips so that by the time you get to the end of the series and in a, it's hard to say my my opinion changes from time to time but i i think most days if you ask me i'd say my favorite of the five is still conquest yeah conquest. what would you say I would. I mean, I have a special. I have a special place in my heart for Beneath the Planet of the Apes, which is weird, um, you know, because it's not particularly a good movie. But I think ultimately, I would probably agree with you on Conquest. Well, Beneath has a lot of cool stuff in it too, though. I mean, it does. It's just so wacky. It's yeah. So, I mean, mm-hmm. Fan though, it's there's something in every one of them. I mean, I would I would still stand up and defend aspects of battle to anybody. Yeah, as bad as that movie is, yeah. and it's not the school it. bus, but yeah, no, not the school bus, but <laughs> yeah, but particularly stuff that like took years before we knew existed, like the extra bits and pieces that I remember seeing as a kid on television, that then weren't on any DVD or video release until they finally came back around to having it again, like that little bit that I remember seeing back then that's back on the DVD now, where you find out that Mendez is the uh, predecessor of the the right. line that will eventually worship the bomb. Right. And talk about making a statement with all the stuff in beneath about the bomb, <laughs> religion and everything. Um, what about you, just, Scott? What is yours? What is your favorite? He likes monkeys. Well, I mean, I, I like monkeys. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> I, you I, both I bananas, like, right? Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, no, I like conquest. I mean, it's good that you like that as well, Arnold. Um, but I've obviously, I, I've always had a soft spot for the first one. Uh, but it's funny because when you were talking about characters and who you're rooting for, I think my my childhood brain twisted things quite a bit, and that may have tainted my opinion of of the films in some way. Not to say that I dislike them or anything, but when I was a kid, I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know if it's a fetish thing. I don't know. It's not. Um, <laughs> we thought the the gorillas were just so damn cool. I and, uh, see that. Yeah, I just thought they were the coolest characters, and so as a as a kid. I watch the movies in a different light, I suppose, because of that. Um, even though, you know, they're, they're just the, ultimately, they're just sort of the aggressors that are the police. But, um, I always just thought they were really, really damn cool characters. And so I always looked for them in the films as I would, you know, move on. And when they didn't, weren't necessarily there sometimes, uh, it really bummed me out. Sure. But there you yeah. go. See, you got a couple examples though of things. First of all, we should step back and say it's another thing about these movies is that overall, and one of the things that the later films in the TV show benefit from, particularly as 20th Century Fox started doing the thing that all 
sensible movie studios do when they have a huge hit, which is great, make another one at half the price of the original. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, so it just starts whittling away. But the one thing they at least had done with the first film was poured money into astonishing set design, costume design, makeup design, so that at least that was in place to some extent throughout the rest of the series. So that even when you get back to battle, for instance, everybody's back in their Planet of the Apes outfits. Yeah. And it looks yeah. good, you know, yeah. because those those costumes are back. Even but, the TV show, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, even the TV show. And even on the TV show, reusing things like the, the – one of the things I always loved, the all-in-one-piece wooden rifles and guns that were the apes, mm-hmm. you know, all-in-one-piece oh, yeah. designs. But it's that design aspect of it that – makes them all pop and the the idea that as crazy as it is and only in science fiction we have this idea that an entire culture will color code itself at any given opportunity (laughs) (laughs) and and everybody will wear matching colors at all times but but you get that but then like scott was saying about gorillas you get a couple examples of they start out as the grunts and in the background of planet the apes but when you get james gregory showing up in beneath Mm. you get a Mm -hmm. phenomenal gorilla character who yeah. is incredibly mesmerizing. He has one of my favorite speeches of all time where he does the whole rallying speech for the war against yeah. the mutants. Yeah. You know? And, and he, he, he sort of takes a boneheaded approach to the whole doomsday bomb thing. Is, well, because is he's still a gorilla. <laughs> right. I, guess so. I mean, and that's the point. I mean, he's still a gorilla. He's still the military mind. So he's not smart, but he's smarter than most of them. Yeah. And, and, and then, of course, you get to the TV show. You've got somebody like Mark Leonard playing the lead yeah. gorilla character. Oh, yeah. yeah. Which, by the way, to step out of the movies, my favorite episode of that is the one where he gets caught in the um, in the subway station. I was just going to say that, yeah. <laughs> is that what it was, the subway station? I just remember them falling together um, underground. Yeah. I think I think it's an old subway station because yeah, they have the posters. Right. Yep. The, the thing is he tries to hide the circus poster from right. him. Right. It shows the gorilla. And he sees it, and, I, and that's another thing about how smart his character is. He sees it, but then he doesn't confront him with it right away. He right. holds on to it for later. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There's a lot of stuff about the show that isn't bad either. There are a lot of people that dismiss the show, but it may not work continuity-wise, but it's it's still an interesting side note to things too, and it benefited from having all of that all that work already done. What all does work is- continuity-wise when you get something that has gone on for that long though, right? Um, that's true. Especially back then. Um, I mean, when you think about it, the continuity on the first five films is actually really strong, considering the time in which it was in which they were made, right? Yeah, and and there are aspects of it that fans to this day still fight over because there are certain key aspects, like the history of the world, in the first five movies that quickly goes off the rails by the time you get to escape. I mean, and the thing, and I know there are entire books out there where people have tried to reconcile everything. I know there's at least one book out there that's tried to create a consistent chronology that takes into account the TV show and the movies and the cartoon and the comics. It's like you can't do that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Don't even try. You can't. <laughs> but like when in Escape, when Cornelius is sitting there telling people that in the Sacred Scrolls is the story of the first ape to say no. And gives you the timeline of all that when in the first movie you're shown that no one outside of Zaius even knows that there was a time where apes served humanity, that that would be blasphemy. Right. To even believe that. And and little things like how they get the ship possibly ready between Beneath and Escape to be able to use it in the first place. And yeah, there's no there's no hope. You can't make this work. <laughs> and that's and I was you know for for decades I always assumed that that was Brent's ship, but it's actually Taylor's ship, isn't it? It has to be Taylor's because Brent's is is torn to pieces. Okay. I always had I always had the impression that say I mean th- th- you can't make it work. It's impossible. That I don't think there's any way that it, there's no logic to it. Of course, here we are talking about logic. We're talking about you know, the future. <laughs> take it over by human. <laughs> you know, if only they were more realistic. But I always felt that what they had to have done then was they had to have pulled Taylor ship out of the water and used Brent ship for parts. Yeah, right. And and got a working ship out of both of them. But it still yeah. doesn't explain how the apes alone could have done that, rebuilt it, figured out how to fly it, launched it without some sort of gantry or mission control or something. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, you know, 
<laughs> it's quite an achievement for the apes to do what they did. Yeah. But you know what bothered me even more about that about that that launch, that unlikely launch, uh, was that as a kid, I just always could would think to myself, "Shit, Taylor could have made it off. He could have he could have yeah. gotten off the planet. You know, the ship could have been fixed. He could have done it. <laughs> Brent could have gone with him. You know, that's yeah. He could have Nova, brought Nova. Uh, Nova didn't have to die. Nova Spoilers have- for by the way, folks. And actually, if you don't. If you haven't seen a movie series that's existed since the late 60s, early 60s, <laughs> I really can't help you at this point. Um, yes, it's the Statue of Liberty at the end. <laughs> All the time. That's the, the surprise. Something that's been parodied ad nauseum in films right. and TV shows for years. Yes, exactly. I hate every ape I see from chimpanzee. Spock, Spock dies also, by the way. What? What? <laughs> right. <laughs> what do you guys think of Brent from Beneath the Planet of the Apes? I think James Franciscus had a thankless task because he had to come in and be the lead after Heston. Yeah. And knowing at that, that point, Heston's coming. Not, yeah, <laughs> after Heston, right. but knowing Heston's coming in in your final act, also to take over. Right. I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> you pansy. They finally build one with a cobalt casing. And by the time you're at that point, it's like Dan Franciscus is just blurring into the background. <laughs> well, I never had a problem with him. I thought he was pretty good. I mean, as a kid and even today, I think, I mean, he's a completely different character. And, and I like him. I, I, no, like, I like him. him too. I like him too. I, I like the way he kind of strikes up this not quite friendship because there's, there's no time in this story to really – deal with anything like that but he like bonds quickly with Novo on on the idea that you know she's the one that finds him and and it's a, a lead back to Taylor and I like the back and forth with with Zero and Cornelius uh and he's good and 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 his only problem is he's just not he's not quite as magnetic as Heston is just automatically going to be so yeah. you know it's then and, and and in a way it's kind of sad because He's one of the real tragedies of the whole series because he always seems like a character that never quite fully gets to grasp what's happened to him, and before too long, he gets gunned down. Yeah, <laughs> big. Time. It's really sad. I mean, he's just he's he's completely thrown into this crate. He and like Heston's a kind of like larger than life guy that apparently it's like, oh, I've wound up in Earth's future. All right then. <laughs> you know, Franciscus's character is just like completely bewildered. Yeah, yeah. stop. Well, Taylor and, didn't. Taylor didn't want to be uh, on Earth anyway with the with humanity. I, but Franciscus, you had the feeling he's got like a mom waiting at home who made him a hot apple pie or something. You know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only Brent would come back. <laughs> he's not come on. back. I, Skipper, you told me you'd bring him back. <laughs> so, oh yes, every him laying there dying, his captain. You know? <laughs> I think he calls him Skipper, doesn't he? I think so. I think you might be right. It's everyone <laughs> ever knew. <laughs> it's like, yep, yep. There you oh, go. Man. How creepy though is that? That the whole once you get to mutant land in that movie, everything just gets so freaky and weird. And from the You're face right. peeling to the psy- mm-hmm. psychic battle with the with the uh, the maces, <laughs> you know, it's to your two your two heroes fighting each other. Like, oh um, yeah. <laughs> The makeup uh, is astonishing again, and and mm-hmm. there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff about like, for instance, well, one thing, how much creepier would it have been if they did the infamous thing? I have to try to find the link so people can see the still photo of this because this is one that most, well, most apes fans will know it. Or was this like a skull thing or no? What was it? Yes, um... it? There was going to be a scene that showed an ape human child. Oh, that's right. There was a hybrid child, and they they shot the scene, or at the very least, they shot makeup tests of a half ape half human child and they realized that that was that I mean can you imagine them trying to do that today they I mean, realized I think, that that was bestiality yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean I think they probably could have gotten it in the film then in the 70s as yeah. opposed to now but they certainly in the, in the G-rated film that features the <laughs> yeah. horrific massacre of all of your all your whole cast basically right? <laughs> right. Those, those movies were rated G weren't they they were rated G that's right <laughs> Blood pouring everywhere, multiple gunshots, people peeling their faces off to reveal radiation. 
And then at the very end, the whole planet blows up. Yeah. Yeah. Rated G starts Friday at a theater near you. Enjoy, kids. <laughs> so, uh, that was the, but what was the expl- – how much – Plot-wise, was that explained that ape child? Because I don't know how it makes sense. The the mutants and the apes, you know, had lived apart for centuries. I thought, right? Yeah. So, I don't remember if the idea was that they had captured apes at some point, and that okay. there was experimentation, or it was something something deliberate. I don't remember exactly how that played out, but obviously they backed off on that. And and yeah. no matter and yeah, beneath. Of all of them, Beneath is the weirdest, creepiest. It all, it's almost like it becomes a whole different sci-fi universe in that movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's just strange stuff. And yet again, notice how much sound and music has to do with these movies, too. Like, the, the first movie is legendary for having this phenomenal Jerry Goldsmith soundtrack where he used all these uh, uh, native instruments and other things to create the sound, and it's just stunning work. And then... Um, I know there was somebody else that came in, later worked on Star Trek a lot too, and I'm totally blanking. Started alternating with him on it, did the music for Beneath. Ah, I feel terrible. I'm not thinking of the name now. But <laughs> it might be Leonard Rosenman, but I might be wrong. I'm um, going to Google it while we talk. Okay, find who did the music. Good. And, uh, but then you have interesting sound stuff, like every time they do the, um, the mind control stuff, you get that little winking, bleeping sound. And at first yep. it sounds kind of silly, but then the more it builds up, it just it it really gets under your skin. Oh yeah, it's creepy. And there's more. I mean, there's a lot of. I mean, there's also the whole thing where, if I remember correctly, Brent is following this sort of humming sound to right. the mutants, right? And right. when he touches, when you touch the bar or something, it, it stops, stops, right? Which again is their attitude toward the apes, and by extension, him as an ancient human who's clearly a stupid. Which is they're using like the most basic primitive, the kind of stuff that you would do with an animal. Right. It's like exactly. he'll fi- he'll find his way by by touching something and realizing that when the humming stops, that's where he's got to go. Right. And mm-hmm. and bringing him in. And instead uh, of giving him cheese, we're going to put him in a white robe and make him sit at our <laughs> Catholic mass okay. where we worship the bomb and. Uh, <laughs> oh, but uh, involuntarily strangled Nova a couple times. <laughs> it was so the composer was Leonard Rosenman. Is that I it? Don't, yeah. Um, okay. Went so. on to do a Star Trek Four, also among other okay. things. Right. But yeah. Uh, but Goldsmith was the one that sort of set the standard with the first movie, and it's oh, yeah. one of his best scores. And, uh, and then he came back for Escape, and that's another thing about Escape. Escape has. I love the soundtracks of these. And actually, um, Scott Woodard Scott. Uh, this is something where I know it's, it's may not be as big a series for you as it as it is for us, but I know one thing that you agree on when it's stuff that you love is how important music and soundtracks can be mm-hmm. to all these things. And, sure. and one of the things growing up and even to this day, I love the soundtracks to all these movies. And uh, it wasn't until, in the scheme of things, just not that long ago, that they finally started to release complete soundtracks of everything. I think it might have been Varese Saraband that did that uh, and and released all of the films. And it was just amazing to me to be able to drive around the car or to sit on the computer and listen to Planet of the Apes music, particularly stuff like that nobody would care about, like, but um, Scott Calora Scott would <laughs> prior, which is the uh, Escape from the Planet of the Apes title theme. Oh, yeah. Which is just this crazy electric yeah. guitar nutty. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love uh, that theme. It's so cheesy and 70s. And, and sometimes I've played it for people. They say, you like that? That's terrible. It's like, no, but it's <laughs> Planet of the Apes. You don't understand. <laughs> it's just great. Taylor's could... traveling thousands of years into the future right now, and he doesn't know it. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> George Taylor. <laughs> George Taylor. <laughs> Complete jerk. <laughs> <laughs> the one of them with us turned into a desiccated corpse. Yeah, well, it happened a long time ago. What are you yeah. going to do? <laughs> yeah, I bagged her before she went. <laughs> of course, George Taylor, being the jerk that he is, is the guy who destroys planet Earth at the end of that's Beneath right. the Planet of the Apes, right? So That's he right. Fulfills, he fills right. his role. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I always, I always love. I was just uh, talking online to somebody about. It. I always, I don't, I don't know how deliberate it was. It seems like it was, and I can't remember if I ever read um, if it was a deliberate choice. But when he has his hand on the control at the very end, and it's dripping with blood, G-rated. Um, <laughs> He's also ha- holding his heart, or something yeah. is hanging out of his yeah. chest because blood is pumping <laughs> out of him for all the. <laughs> You know, bullet wounds he's just received in right. this. It's a, it's a double feature of Herbie the Love Bug <laughs> and Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Walt Disney presents. <laughs> and man is capable of nothing but destruction. The kid's walking out wild eyed, stunned. <laughs> I just saw a man bleed out. Yeah, well, that happens in G rated movies sometimes. But did you like the Herbie car? The Herbie car was fun. <laughs> But at the very end, when he's got his hand on the control, yeah. his fingers are all curled up, and it looks like an ape hand. Mm. Mm. Always, yeah. I've always yeah. loved that, and I it's this idea that like human ape, it doesn't matter. We're all connected, and and then the the one thing I'd say that I really really don't like about Beneath is the completely unnecessary Paul Freese narration at the end. I, it is unnecessary for sure. I, I think I've just, I've you know listened to it so many times that it's just. I, I can't separate it from the film, no, so I love I, it for that. You know, it's almost like the um, the Deckard uh, narrate the Harrison Ford narration in the original theatrical cut. Oh yeah, like I've just that was the version of the I watched that movie ten thousand times. That version of it, so I just can't separate it. I mean, it's there. Oh, I, I know sushi, cold fish. <laughs> That's what my wife called me. I'm gonna race. That's pretty much it. I just go and give a crap. <laughs> I'm just gonna throw this whole take away. We're using it. <laughs> We're using everything you say, Harrison. We got you for the afternoon. We're going with it. <laughs> Spark, Spock, sabotage the system. Yeah, those, the, yeah. these, these movies. Do, um, I mean, they did. They managed to traumatize me each and every one of them. <laughs> each, each, each ending. You know. I mean, the, oh, the stat, Statue of Liberty, the the death of Nova, Brent. <laughs> Taylor yeah. and the planet Earth, <laughs> the, the the talking, um, and then in Escape from Planet Earth, it's death of Cornelius Zero, the baby, um, and then the talking baby, right? Yep. <laughs> which then, which is also done. I know, I know, and again, that's another thing. Like when when you see these things in childhood, you can't, like you say, you can't separate it. As an adult, I look at it now, and it kind of bothers me that that's silly. They're looping the shot a loop. of, yeah. of it at the end, but it's still so creepy. <laughs> Yeah, with with you hearing him wailing into the credits, yep. that it just it makes your blood run cold. Yeah, it really is. And you know you can't do an ending like that anymore. Oh, the first three endings, and well, the first four. I can't remember battle too clearly, but they Uh-oh, all on the traumatized me as a kid. Out of all of them, battle, is the one that gave me nightmares. The one with the the crying statue. It's... The the statue's crying. How can a statue <laughs> cry? <laughs> <laughs> See, as a kid, you were talking about Neath. As a kid, Battle took me completely by surprise. I loved the movies. I was enjoying the series. And then when you get to the end of Battle, it took me by surprise because as a kid, I, I, I'm trying to reconstruct what I thought back then. I think I might have thought that we were actually supposed to take that literally. Like I felt like suddenly reality in the films had jumped to another <laughs> weird level. And it's like, why is the statue now crying? But it gave me nightmares the, the crying Caesar statue and you you when you were saying like they all end i mean conquest also ends with the nightmarish city in flames the with him you know and i love being such a fan of that one i love the fact that after all these years thanks to the blu-rays we can now see the restored original version of conquest that yeah. featured all of the blood and violence at the end that they cut out, including the original version of the ending that did not dial back Caesar's call to action. Yeah. Which at oh, the yeah. time they were terrified about because they knew that it was going to spark a great deal of agreement with his final speech, which yeah. is why you get the horribly awkwardly edited and loop thing about now it's time to put our wear weapons and all that. <laughs> yeah, with that extreme close up of his eyes, which yet <laughs> is so creepy in and of itself. Yes. And again, I think it goes part, you know, if you watched, just watched it now as an adult for the first time, you'd be like, what the hell is this? Um, it's clearly been edited. But as a kid, having seen it so many times, it's just a, another 
another weird creepy factor that build that is adding to the weird creepiness building within you watching the apes <laughs> marathon that week you know so <laughs> i know it, it doesn't go anywhere good they're all <laughs> every one of these ends horrible in some way or another and it just keeps getting worse i mean rated g killing rated cornelius g. and zero who was so beloved and they had you know we'd, we'd seen them in basically three movies um and, yeah, I was gonna say before I, I real it's such a shame that it's not Roddy McDowell and Beneath, but it but it's it's I think it was oh God David um, can't remember his name now. He does a perfectly decent job taking his place, and he isn't in it much. But right. it's a shame that it's not him. Yeah, I mean they're kind of that that movie. The whole the it's like it feels a little Planet of the Apes. Part one light in a way like they yeah. they feel this yeah. need to rush through everything that happened to Taylor with with Brent and like they do it in like twenty minutes you know yeah. like that's right and it's not necessary they didn't need to do that stuff and so even the presence of Cornelius and Zira is superfluous I think to the film yeah. so so if you're not going to have Roddy McDowell in one of them that's the one I guess right I guess so yeah and certainly in Escape there's no way that movie could exist without the two of them. Oh, no. Because the heart and soul of that whole movie is the two of them. Yeah. Uh, and his fall at the end of that one with the, the uh. weird the weird thing he chose to do with the, like, the, <laughs> yeah, the gurgling. God, that just that takes everything out of you. It's just yeah. horrible. What is – Scott, do you remember what we're talking yes. about? Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, the, yeah, I mean, there's, and then also, like, why does she throw the baby in the water? I'm not <laughs> clear on that. It's not it doesn't really quite entirely make sense why she chooses to do that because I mean obviously they're trying to convince them that they didn't leave the baby behind but I don't know why she thinks dropping it in the water is going to make any difference. Yeah, I don't either. Cuz they're going to fish it out anyway. I mean yeah. and if she's trying to like obscure anything what's the, I don't see why that matters at all. It seems actually yeah. kind of weird at that moment she should hold <laughs> to it. It's it's so a very they, odd final act. Yeah. Right? And they even call attention to it. So, like, they're standing there in the docks, like, why is she doing that? And we're all <laughs> doing that. Oh, she threw the prop baby overboard. Oh. <laughs> it's like a little plastic baby. <laughs> to this, and, and I think Escape from the Planet of the Apes is one of the movies that, more than anything else, as a kid, cemented for all time. And actually, I, I might even be able to credit Escape from Planet Apes for why I love Doctor Who so much and so many other things, because I think that's the movie that made me really fall in love with time travel, but mm-hmm. maybe some of the classic Star Trek. And the whole scene of Hasline explaining on television about an artist spending a picture of an artist spending a picture of a landscape, I, I, I seem to remember that I probably drew um, some kind of grid... <laughs> some kind of chart <laughs> to follow all that at some point and it was just uh yeah i mean i just fell in love with this whole idea to like okay it's a loop and it's just fantastic stuff <laughs> you know the not to dwell on all these deaths too much but i'm think I'm, I'm just thinking you would never i mean it's you would you would never kill your main characters off in a film these days in a in a mainstream hollywood picture right but not just that, but I mean, they're, they're so violent. Where the way not only does Cornelius get shot, but he takes that terrible fall, right? Oh. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the blood is pouring copiously at the end of the movie. I mean, Brent pinned against the wall, bleeding profusely, and like we said, Heston's blood is just pumping out of him. And it's also that that really great bright red blood that oh, was. Yeah. Nice, it, oh yeah, it's like temp, tempera paint. Yeah, yeah but exactly. So much of it. <laughs> it's like Grand Guignol. Yeah, it's just out of control. Thing, when they restored the end of Conquest, now you see they had a lot of bloody stuff in, Con- in Conquest. That growing up, uh, the version that was the theatrical version, they they'd cut a lot of that out. So they really did dial it back in Conquest. Oh, we get Armando. Is, uh, we didn't even mention that Ricardo Montalban, who who wins our hearts instantly in Escape. <laughs> Only to survive long enough to be in the beginning of conquest and kill himself. Skyscraper. Lousy and human bastard. <laughs> and the kids love it. The kids love that stuff. <laughs> Severn Darden, certainly one of our go-to guys for anybody. Anybody whose childhood crosses over with the seventies. Oh, yeah. Sever- 
Garden is an inescapable presence, whether he, from these or his appearance on Six Million Dollar Man or countless other TV shows. And he just had that perfect heavy lidded kind of almost Nazi like disconnection from everything, like in Conquest, where they said, Well, you haven't wanted to be electrocuted. Well, electrocute him now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he's fantastic. Well, electrocute him. He's. <laughs> It's all very troubling, but now I'm thinking of the electrocution, which is is it's fake, well, right? But, that's horrific. But it's horrific, but it, it's uh, Caesar's faking it at one point, right? They have him wired up. He and McDonald runs down to turn the power off, which he couldn't have known would happen. But because Caesar's brilliant, he looks over and sees right. the gauges are all down. All right. so now, now he knows they're going to execute him, and he better make it look good. So he fakes. His death by electrocution, which, again, I'm thinking now, looking back, is one of those moments as a kid that I was probably thinking, this is one of the most horrific things I've ever seen. Yeah, traumatizing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Keith R.A. DeCandido, international best-selling and award-winning author of over 40 novels, as well as comic books, short stories, novellas, and more. I'm also an editor, currently hiring out through Creditorial, a musician, currently percussionist for the Boogie Nights, and a whole lot more. Hear me talk about my writing and my life, and also do readings from my work on my twice-monthly podcast, Dead Kitchen Radio, part of the Chronic Rift Network. For more information, go to chronicrift.com or to deadkitchenradio.mevio.com. 1981, a virus from space kills all dogs and cats on the Earth. 1985, chimpanzees and gorillas are adopted as pets. The pets evolve into slaves, beaten and tortured victims of mankind. And now, a chimpanzee rises to give the word for the revolt of the apes. My people will plot for the inevitable day of man's downfall. And that day is upon you now! Conquest of the planet of the apes. It's all new. The biggest and most exciting ape picture yet, as a world of apes battles for domination of planet Earth. The Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, from 20th Century Fox, rated PG, parental guidance suggested. The most awesome spectacle in the annals of science fiction. So what did you guys think of the, uh, of the, the new one, Rise of the Planet of the Apes? So anyway, okay, so well, so let's say, I mean, obviously we spend a lot of time talking about the movies. We really, there's no time to talk about all the stuff about this whole franchise because yeah. it really is so sprawling. It's an incredible sprawling series of that's touched in so many other media. And it's been through times where it's kind of gone dormant. And apart from fans, it's it's disappeared from time to time. The Tim Burton remake, as we already talked about, was a misfire that could have revitalized things but didn't and then along came rise of the planet of the apes in was it 2011 um with andy circus playing caesar in what was sort of a remake of conquest in many ways mm. yeah um at least in terms of the idea that both start at the present day and show the rise of a more intelligent breed of ape that is led by someone called caesar and um and i loved rise of the planet of the apes because I thought it did what Burton's did not do. It did certainly uh, stake its claim at, at basically restarting things for all intents and purposes, but it did it with all the apparent love and respect for the original series that Burton's didn't seem to have. Yeah, and de- deliberately put, including all of those continuity nods in there, too. Like like in, the fact... In, in Rise. Yeah, like you can keep throughout the whole movie, you hear news reports about the Icarus being lost. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just beautiful. <laughs> and it's great stuff like that, yeah. And that he's called Bright Eyes, and they get some of the lines of dialogue in there. It's it's all those little fan touches that are great. But besides that, I just... I really liked it a lot. I thought it did a great job of doing something that fits today, but that also didn't feel like it was really violating any of the sense of what made things great then. I mean, there was no way they were going to put, well, I'm sure it could have looked great because we have the practical effects talk in the many times in past episodes, but there was probably no chance that they were going to do this that way. And I think this is one of the few cases where they've done a movie with a CGI character where it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Well, it is the, it it is the, the, the Weta team, right? The, the guys who did Gollum and, 
King Kong and, one, and another example. One of the only other ones where you see a, a CGI character that you can actually get an emotional yeah. vibe off of, and and yeah. once and Andy Circus sort of driving the character. Yeah, so I but, think that's a big part of it for sure, right? Yeah, even Franco couldn't hurt it. No matter. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think he was fine. He was totally fine. He was I fine. Know. I mean, it's a little goofy. The science, you know, some of the scientist dialogue. Just knowing that it's Franco, um, it's not fair. To, <laughs> it's not fair to Franco, but just knowing it's Franco, you know, it's just it's hard, a little hard to swallow at times. Um, I remember but you also get John Lithgow, who's amazing in that oh, movie. Oh, he is. Yeah, he really is. Yeah, yeah, he's great. It's fun <clears throat> to watch his character's whole story. That's just. That's too close to real, that, that part of things. Yeah. You know, actually, I, um, <clears throat> this morning I was watching um, X-Men First Class, uh, which came out that same summer from Fox um, and uh, sort of in a way it was similar to uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes in that it was a kind of a soft reboot, I guess, of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, but on the DVD, they had a trailer for Rise of the Planet of the Apes. And my kid, who's only six years old, he saw the trailer um, – and he was very taken by it. Uh, and he hasn't seen the Apes movies yet. We haven't really gotten into that. Really? Oh, okay. Um, no, it's de- you know, they're rated G. <laughs> they are, so. exactly. you know. There's nothing wrong with them. He should be fine. I think we're going to start with, we're just going to go straight to the um, the Caesar electrocution scene. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a, there's a moment in the trailer uh, where Lithgow, I guess, forgets how to use it because of the Alzheimer's. He forgets how yeah. to use it. And and Caesar just corrects him and show and hands it to him and he's kind of they share this sort of gla- look with one another and mm-hmm. this is just in the trailer you know it's just so, so effective uh, yes. and I think it speaks to a lot of what makes that film work. This drug could save millions of lives. We test one subject. Oh, he's a smart one, isn't he? Caesar has skills that far exceed that of a human. Is company property. You have no idea what you're dealing with. Don't ever let them catch you. Ready PG-13. When it first came out, I was I liked it, but I felt it dumbed things down a little bit. Um, and you know, the more time passes, I can't defend that argument as much now. I don't quite mm-hmm. know. What I, why I felt that it might have been coming from the Franco thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not hmm. sure. Maybe I felt like it hurried to the um, the death, uh, the doom of mankind a bit too. In the end, like that, that felt a little rushed, almost like the plague deserved its own movie, maybe or something. You know. So. <laughs> well, it does look like we're going to get a bit of the aftermath. But one of the things I really loved about it, I I I really loved that though because I thought the end credit sequence of that. Oh. Yeah, was a stunning piece of storytelling that was being done graphically. Yeah, and and I really thought that was well done. It was like, in, and in a way, while while you could be right that there could have been a movie in it, I kind of like the idea that, like, okay, if they're not going to do that, if they want to jump forward, this is brilliant because they're showing you visually in the space of like five minutes. Here's why everything is going to be really, really terrible in the next movie. <laughs> and and it, it accomplished it beautifully, I thought. I love that whole map sequence. It's just great. And it's, it's, it fits – I'm sorry, Scott. It fits with the, um, the idea of the uh, sort of dark, weird ending of a Planet of the Apes movie as well. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it yeah. does. Uh, I was just going to say that when it came out um, – well, I did see First Class and enjoyed that. Um, I didn't see Rise in the theater. Uh, it was only some time later that I actually watched it and sat down with my wife and we watched it. And we both absolutely loved it. But I think there was, unfortunately, some Tim Burton baggage there that I was really nervous going into this new Apes movie. Mm-hmm. Um, even knowing who had worked on it and that, you know, Weta was involved and everything. But we were just so thrilled and so surprised by it that it, it it's wound up being one of those films that if we ever catch it on, we we leave it on. I think being a classic Apes fan... It won me over so much, I, and and I don't know to what extent maybe Burton's film um, lowered the bar to the extent that I was more <laughs> prepared to accept this one. But I think that would be that would be unfair to this movie because I really think it did so many things well that by the time you get to like the third act, 
and Caesar comes through the mist riding a horse. It's like this is just paying off everything that I'd want to see <laughs> uh, yeah. and doing a really nice job of it. And I am so looking forward to the next one. And that's one thing oh, we yeah. say is that this year, the, f- the first sequel of this new cycle is coming along, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. I love these titles, too. I like the way that Dawn <laughs> is now both zombies and apes have now had their had their dawn. Is, uh, See, and it all ties back to the blind dead. That's right. See? Revenge from Planet Ape is coming. <laughs> um, dawn of the Planet Apes with Circus back again, obviously. And as you were saying earlier, not no Franco this time. Gary Oldman, however. Gary yeah. Oldman's going to be in this one. Mm-hmm. Um, I just hope they, you know, after three movies in Batman of not really getting much of an opportunity to do it, I hope they give him a chance to yell a little bit in this one. Cause <laughs> <laughs> unless he's slowing down his old age. And obviously it's going to pick up, if anybody has already seen some of the early stuff that's already come out, including the website, which features some beautiful uh, cityscapes and forestscapes that show the the landscape of a near post-apocalyptic uh, future, that they're pushing things ahead a little bit from the previous film and showing what's happened after the virus has laid waste to things. And in many ways, I'm already getting a vibe from this that feels like it's going to feel even more like an apes movie than the first one. Yeah, I because it's right. going to start to world build that disconnected future of our civilization falling apart. Yeah, I don't expect a happy ending on this one, though. Either. I sure hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I think things are only going to continue to get worse. I'll be and pretty I- disappointed if this has a happy ending. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. Who wants a happy ending? But right. And so the third, the third film is already in progress. Um, I mean, who knows if, of course the success or or lack of success of Dawn is going to determine whether the third film actually happens. But mm-hmm. Matt Reeves, who's directing the second film, um, Dawn, has already signed on to direct a third film. Um, and he and did the first one, right? No, he did He did not. Um, he didn't do the so, first one? Okay. No. Um, it, the first one was um, Ru- a guy named Rupert, Rupert Everett? Does that sound right? No. Unless Cemetery Man directed Rise of Planet. <laughs> 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 right. Um Rupert someone. Rupert Sand <laughs> Rupert Sand Rupert Pumpkin. <laughs> Pumpkin. <laughs> now I have to look it up. Uh he, he jumped ship at some at some point and um uh Rupert Wyatt, that's right. Rupert Wyatt. So, oh is that okay, yeah. So, so Matt Reeves is coming in. Okay, Matt Reeves is coming in, um, but apparently has um the studios every confidence because they already have signed him on to do a third one. And apparently he supposedly did, go right into it and do um Oh like, really? Just jump right into the third then? That was the report, so we'll see. Now he has he did uh, he did Cloverfield, he did Let Me In, the remake mm-hmm. of Let Right One In. Yep, he mm-hmm. did some good stuff in the. I mean, Cloverfield people split one way or the other, but but then again, that's a very unique kind of thing. Unless they go found footage with an apes movie, I don't think we have to worry about. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> the found footage apes movie. See. Hey, you know what? Now, now, having said this, that they'll either a steal it from me, or b, I desperately hope they don't steal it from me. Which <laughs> is, what if you did a whole series of these movies, but then do basically catch back up to Planet of the Apes, but do Taylor's arrival as a found footage film? That would so be... that he he'd have like a mounted camera on his astronaut outfit. So that first appearance in the in the forest with the gorillas coming through the the grass, everything would be found footage instead. Right. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. All right. I was just throwing that out there, but, you know, <laughs> we'll stay away from that. You know, I think they, they really do hope to get to that point where they can build to, if not Taylor, build to build to sort of what the first film was. Um, sure, sure. I mean, I think, I think the studio really has high hopes for this franchise it'd be really amazing if at the end of the third one it it like you know we, we dip to black it fades up it says however you know many years have gone by and you see an ape looking up in the sky as the ship comes down that would oh, be all awesome. nice that would be freaking awesome <laughs> but but he's got to be wearing the correct color-coded outfit for whatever <laughs> Speaking of outfits, um, some some years ago, I don't know if it was the 30th or 35th anniversary of the original film. Uh, I was at E3, and they were there was a company that was going to be doing a, a Planet of the Apes video game, um, which I don't think actually ever made it to uh, uh, to the market. I think there might have been one that came later, but this first one, 
E3 is typical like that. You know, they'll show a million things on the floor and you'll never see them. But I was walking down an aisle and there was a cage, like sort of a, dame, a domed cage with a bunch of uh, uh, humans in it, <laughs> uh, actors, of course. And there were some apes and there was a big gorilla, a huge one, and a couple of other ones there. There was a chimp, a chimpanzee. And, and as I'm walking up there, minding my own business, sort of just glancing at these guys because they look amazing, the uh, gorilla grabs me. <laughs> And drags me uh, like across the floor <laughs> over towards the cage, and the chimp is like luring me in, and I'm like, "What is going on?" <laughs> and it wound up being two of my effects buddies. Ah. Uh, I used to work in the effects industry, and uh, they were in these amazing costumes and makeups that they had done themselves, actually, and they were there doing the show. But it was just That's such awesome. a surreal moment because they were picture perfect costumes. <laughs> And they were leaning down. They're like, "Hey, Scott, it's us. It's it's, it's, it's me, Roy." <laughs> I tell you, you could have had a lawsuit on your hands there. <laughs> yeah, it was some strangers. But when as soon as I found out it was those guys, it was awesome. <laughs> I was like, I got sucked into a, an apes movie, so to speak. A picture, if you will, one Scott Woodard. G to V. Greetings. I'm Kevin Lauderdale. And the name of the show is, It Has Come to My Attention. Once a month, I spend just a few minutes drawing your attention to genre-related things that may have slipped under your geek radar. Classic movies finally out on DVD or Blu-ray, not-so-well-known books, audio, graphic novels. Not the sort of stuff you'll see on Amazon's front page, but the sort of treasures that are buried several clicks in under the recommendations carousel. About half the time I mention things for proper geek parents or put into the hands of proper geek kids. And sometimes I even do a funny voice or two. All of this for free as part of the Chronic Rift Network. Available on iTunes and at chronicrift.com. Now comes the final chapter in the most remarkable science fiction series of our time. Battle for the Planet of the Apes. The final chapter in the incredible ape saga as two civilizations battle for the right to inherit what's left of the Earth. Battle for the Planet of the Apes from 20th Century Fox, rated G. I don't know what else there is to say. I mean, there's so much more that we could talk about, and obviously yeah. we just go on and on. But one of, one of the things that I think we certainly covered is that it's one of those series that when you got into it, it certainly inspired a lot of passion to stick with it as a fan. You were you were seeing it, and and also I think a lot of it has to do with a time when you grew up too. Um, I don't know. Maybe kids growing up now will see the circus movies, and I and I mean Andy Circus. And <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to hide the circus really, movies from the gr- yeah. from the gorilla. Um, but I right. know that like all of us growing up seeing the Planet of the Apes movies, it's something that you were very steeped in because of the era in which you were and the fact that they were so rerun and that they were such a huge part of pop culture for such a long time even after the movies had long been passed they were still lingering throughout the 70s it's just yeah. iconic yeah. and and then they kind of passed you know away and and like i said were dormant and then the burton one many years later didn't work and now they're they're reinventing them but i don't know that it'll ever be quite the same although i do know like as as recently as um the last few months, what is the? I forget how that toy company is pronounced. If it's Nika or Neca, mm. uh, that they're they're starting a whole Planet of the Apes line because yep. of these films, but they are also including the classic license. Nice. Uh, and there's a Doctor Zaius figure is one of the first things coming out, and they've put pictures out of what that looks like, and he looks perfect. Yeah. So um, the the imagery from those original movies, I don't think that's going away, even if these new ones continue to be the the thread of story that most people are going to be familiar with now. I don't think the old movies are going to go away. No, and they, sh- and they shouldn't. I mean, you know, uh, and I think as, as a, um, you know, if you're, if you're a 20th century Fox managing your brand, uh, do- it doesn't make any sense to try to erase the, you know, the classic imagery, uh, the, uh, the idea of the original films. I mean, there's a lot of money to be made there. You know, you can keep releasing the Blu-rays and, Sell sure. toys and and all the rest of it. You know, you can continue that universe um, in the comics or whatever, which I, I guess is something that goes on, right? Um, oh yeah, yeah. So I, but I guess I this, should. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just to say, but if you counter that with like how Paramount has approached the whole Star Trek thing, there's a certain sense, and I can't really back this up, but I think some fans have a sense. 
that Paramount is embarrassed by any Star Trek that predates J.J. Abrams now, in a way. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'd certainly agree with that. Yeah, you know, um, and I, I'm not sure that that makes sense, just from a business standpoint, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, it's all out there, fans want all of it, so... I was going to say, you were saying about how they, they keep bringing out the Blu-rays and stuff, and the, and the other thing, too, is the same kind of thing we've often talked about, about, like, vintage film or black-and-white movies or old horror science fiction. Kids can still enjoy it if they don't come to it with any preconceptions, which are usually put on it by people that are introducing it in the first place. You just say, Absolutely. oh, it's a cool movie. And And I know that, like I was saying earlier, I use it in classes. I sometimes get from, like, a college-age crowd – an initial reaction to Planet of the Apes that usually hits in the first few minutes when the apes first show up about the makeup. And and maybe a few laughs here and there about, oh, really? Is that what they're going to look And And I'm, I, I, I'm not surprised anymore, but early on I was a little surprised sometimes how quickly that would go away. They'd mm-hmm. get really invested in the movie after they got past that. To the point that by the time they're getting the end of the movie, you were hearing gasps and things about, oh, I hope Cornelius makes it out okay. And, I hope... <laughs> and, and it's like the makeup doesn't matter anymore. And that right. just shows how well it works. That yeah. it doesn't, it's not a barrier, even for people that are used to other things. You can really still get invested in those characters. Yeah. And, you're, and you're mentioning comics. Like I'll, I'll do a, a thing, toot my own horn kind of thing. Uh, that we've been doing from time to time here anyway. But there was there was a brief window of time that I would have counted as one of my greatest moments that I would have been so proud to do where where I almost had the opportunity to do a licensed Planet of the Apes comic. Oh. Uh with uh a writing partner and I who at the it was during a time where we were part of a group that we were also pitching Star Trek regularly. Just at the end of Deep Space Nine and into Voyager, we were part of a group that we would regularly get to call and, and pitch ideas to the show. And the first time we did that, we got to go out to Paramount to do it, which was really cool. But after that, we were trying to cultivate some other things. And for a while, we were dealing with 20th Century Fox, and nobody there cared about the apes anymore. Nobody. And there hadn't been anything comic-related going on, and we came up with a whole pitch that my partner had also been doing some graphic design, designed as if it was a internal government document from like the Hasline archives or something or other uh, detailing all the stories that were going to be done, including some things that we had come up with that I still to this day love. There were like these little things that we came up with about, you know, what did Zaius know and when did he know it and what's going on behind the scenes of Planet of the Apes. And just as we were that close to things really rolling along, our contact there told us that the entire Apes license was being locked down because they were developing a film. Uh... And it was, if I remember correctly, it was when Cameron was doing it. Oh, right. Oh, that's right. right. And right. and at that point, it was like, well, we're not pursuing anything with the classic apes anymore because we don't know what's going to happen yet. And it all ended. And after that, and mm. then nothing happened anymore. And it's like, ah, oh, I would have loved to have done that. Missed it by that much. Yes. Yes. You never know. I mean, you still but have no. the ideas, right? I still, yeah, and I still have my idea for the sixth movie. Well, basically, the the book or the comic that was going to be one of the big things was going to be here's the sixth movie that closes the gap between battle and planet. And uh, since it's good, I'd, I'd be happy to tell you, but I won't say it while we're talking on the show. Can you just give, <laughs> just, can you just give us the pitch on it, though? Well, I don't want to say the thing. the The whole okay. idea, the, the whole uh, the sixth. The stick, the idea was going to be like now is actually back then it was it wasn't a thing now it seems a lot of comic publishers do that thing where they do this is season eight of Buffy yeah, this yeah. is the next season of that this i this pitch was the idea that this is going to be the sixth movie that you didn't see and it was Destiny of the Planet of the Apes and it was going to tie together it was going to take place about thirty forty years after Battle and set things up for Planet. But the thing I was trying to think of was what would be a way that would throw fans completely. And the only way I could think of was to break the time loop that seemed inevitable when you watch the five movies. Mm-hmm. And and I won't say any more because one day somebody will steal it from me. <laughs> so um, I'll tell you guys, though, and we're not on anymore. But, but I always loved the idea. And, you know, who knows? Maybe one day awesome. could happen. Yeah. Very cool. But I'm very much looking forward to Dawn, and I'm looking forward to seeing where they take this, and if they do continue to pay homage more and more until we've caught up to the 3900s again. I think we've chatted about it um, 
on Twitter, maybe that, you know, circus, of course, could continue. I mean, you could take big time jumps forward in the story and still retain Andy Circus, just as uh, Riley McDowell stayed on and, and played two characters. Well, he played three characters, but if you include the TV show, mm-hmm. um, there's no reason Circus couldn't couldn't place, you know, Caesar's descendant in Planet, you know, Planet of the Apes mm-hmm. four or whatever. Like you can, sure. so and because I think he is pretty key to the the series at this point. I mean, he is kind of the Roddy McDowell of the uh, of the the rebooted franchise. I think so, and I think it, it'd be a shame for us to finish without mentioning. We did talk about it quite a bit, but that really does come down. I mean, Kim Hunter up to a certain point. I mean, she's certainly in the three of them and also helps to sort of win you over. But oh, yeah. it's amazing how much the entire series, even as as large as Heston looms early on, how much the entire series really comes down to Roddy McDowell. Yeah. That he becomes the centerpiece of the entire thing, continues in the TV show. And you're right, in a way, Andy Serkis' presence in this new series, it's not the same kind of thing, but he could very well become uh, this version's uh uh, Roddy McDowell in that uh, in that way, maintaining that same kind of sensibility that Roddy McDowell carried through his characters. Maybe you'd see turn up in Circus's performances throughout the whole thing. It's amazing yeah. how he really, when you really think of it, it's just uh, it's it's still amazing that he isn't in Beneath. You just don't really you don't even notice sometimes. He just such a huge presence you forget yeah. that isn't mm-hmm. even him. Yeah, it's true. And you're too busy watching those, you know, everyone get machine gunned anyway. So. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Let's hope that Dawn features a lot of random machine gunning. <laughs> Electrocution. Electrocution, people bleeding randomly, setting off <laughs> large atomic devices. We didn't even talk about the crucified bleeding ape visions, did, That's did we? That's right. That movie oh, is just a massive, like, LSD trip fever dream <laughs> That movie makes no sense at all. And, of course, it also has the Vietnam protest scene with the handheld. Yes. <laughs> um, but, see, that's where Zayas kind of emerges as a hero, too, where he rides right through the vision. It's He's true. Like, I'm not yeah. going to buy into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw him in an old Columbo that was done, like, only a couple years after one of the Planet of the Apes movies. And he's playing a butler in that, which he seemed to do a lot. But as he's walking around, all I can see is Dr. Zayas. He just seems to <laughs> still be walking like that. Right. Didn't he play he used to, he played um Elizabeth Montgomery's uh dad on Bewitched as well, That's right? right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I just saw Columbo from uh the same year as Escape from the Planet of the Apes with Kim Hunter in it. And the one thing that struck me is she was so loud and over the top in the whole scene. It was like, I think she thought she still had the makeup on. <laughs> yeah, she was emoting a little yeah. bit too much, I think. She's and... just that, it's at 11 the whole time. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> you're not Zira anymore. It's okay. You can calm down a little bit. Oh, uh, well. So we like apes. Basically. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Apes are back. Apes are back in the theaters. July <laughs> 2014. It's cool to like apes again. It is cool yes. to like apes again. That's a fantastic way of wrapping it up. It's true. <laughs> and that'll be the title of the show. I think it's going to have to be now. It might have to be. It is cool to like apes again. And thanks once again to Scott Kalora for joining us for this episode. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your podcast and what listeners might expect over there? Well, thanks for having me. It was great fun. So, yeah, we have a a little show called Transporter Room 3 where we beam in and talk about Star Trek. Uh, And, you know, we kind of try to not take the whole thing too seriously. It's kind of just, I mean, we love Star Trek and we know way too much about it, but we try to have a little fun with it and I'm sure that we're not half as funny as we think we are, but uh, uh, it's um, uh, you can find it at tr- uh, transporterroom3.blogspot.com because we're too cheap to buy the uh, the URL. <laughs> 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 and you can also just find me on Twitter at Scott IGN, uh, where I tweet out links to new episodes. And uh, we hope to have you guys on as guests very soon, actually, to talk I'm, talk Trek. That would be awesome. And we love Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> Star Trek's back in the theaters. <laughs> uh, well, not quite yet, but yeah. Not quite yet. Who knows? But yeah, absolutely, anytime. Has there ever love... been an Apes Trek crossover? Oh, my God. You know, I don't think so. 
if anyone's listening and does know, feel free to correct me, but I don't believe so. They've done some strange things over the years, like uh, <laughs> they've done Star Trek X-Men, which I never needed to read in my lifetime. <laughs> Star- X-Planet. Star Trek Doctor Who, which, again, less yeah. said about that, the better. Um, but uh, I don't think with apes, no. There have been right. some strange things with apes in comics, too. Some very odd companies from time to time had gotten a hold of, uh, I think there was Adventure Comics. It was a very much more obscure company. It had the apes license for a while. It was probably in the early 90s, somewhere around there. Probably some of the best stuff in comics was when Marvel had them in the 70s and did the yeah. Planet of the Apes magazine. And that had some fantastic stuff in it. But uh, who knows? The day for apes in comics, uh, well, they, they are doing some now and may come again. Spring the trap. Into the jail with him. I must plan an escape. He'll never escape. Planet of the Apes Forbidden Zone Trap. Figures sold separately by Miko. Hey everybody, this is Scott. I hope you enjoyed going ape with me, Arnold, and our very special guest, Scott Colura, senior editor at IGN Entertainment and co-host of the Transporter Room 3 podcast. As a follow-up to our roundtable discussion, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about a lesser-known role-playing game called Terra Primate from Eden Studios. Originally published in 2002, Terra Primate was designed by Patrick Sweeney, David F. Chapman, Al Bruno III, and C.J. Carella. It uses the Eden House system, known as Unisystem, and the compact 256-page hardcover book contains everything you need to play and run adventures in a crazy, mixed-up world of intelligent apes. While the book does not focus on any particular world, it does offer a few different customizable setting options, referred to as Ape Worlds, in much the same way as Eden's most famous RPG line, All Flesh Must Be Eaten. A few of my personal favorite world concepts include Dominant Species, which is essentially the default setting for the game that offers a true Planet of the Apes, or at least a close unauthorized facsimile, Ape Apocalypse, a post-apocalyptic setting that combines elements of Beneath the Planet of the Apes, and yes, that means mutants, uh, with the Road Warrior, and Simians and Sorcerers, yes, high fantasy with apes. Like all flesh must be eaten, Terra Primate's character creation rules offer three character types including pre-heroic, heroic, and powered. And these powered characters have various psionic abilities available to them. It also offers a selection of character archetypes, including a few you might expect to see in a game like this, including Astronaut and Savage Girl. If you're interested in checking it out, follow the links in our show notes, or pop on over to eBay. There always seem to be several low-priced copies available for purchase there. If you have a game, movie, book, toy, album, or a comic you'd like reviewed on the podcast, get in touch with us at contact at g2vpodcast.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of G2V. Pop on over to g2vpodcast.com for links to all our episodes, as well as show notes and our Three is a Magic Number series. Subscribe to us on iTunes, and please rate and review us while you're there. Follow us on Twitter at G2V Podcast. Join our Facebook page. And our email address is contact at g2vpodcast.com. Join me, Elvis Preston, with the sexy Anne Murray and the number one pals, Charlie and Ray, as we go on a wild adventure, man, in my new hit movie, The Planet with Some Apes. Boy, this planet's lousy with monkeys. Monkey business, monkey monkey business. 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 Monkey business, monkey monkey business.